this talk is going to uh, be about our efforts in building the Amazon product knowledge graph. In contrast to some of the works in the morning, this will be probably at a lower level and probably more academic style, uh, but I promise no equations. Uh, so what is the difference between a product graph and a knowledge graph? So a uh, knowledge graph models entities, relations, and types. So for instance, Julia Roberts is an entity of the type person. She appeared in the movie Larry Crown. So Larry Crown is of the type movie. And the relationship between them is of the type acting. A product graph models entities that we consume. So the movie Larry Crown may appear in a digital format, a DVD format, or a Blu-ray format, which now becomes its types. Therefore, all the entities that are, that are associated with uh, Larry Crown in the knowledge graph also become a part of the product graph. So now you may ask whether a product graph is a subset of the knowledge graph or vice versa. So the reality is something like this. There is a fair amount of overlap between the two in terms of the uh, common themes like movies, music, and books. A generic knowledge graph would mostly model named entities like location, relation, organization, and persons. On the other hand, the product graph models all the entities that you may want to consume or, for example, buy in Amazon, like all the hard lines like consumer electronics, uh, groceries, dresses, and so on. So in general, it is a far bigger set. So this is another example of a product graph. And I don't think you can see the relations. You can only see the tips. Uh, so here, the central entities are detergents. And the peripheral entities are concept nodes which are like form, function, brands, color, and so on, which are the attributes of the product. So we want to build a graph like this for all different verticals and from all different sources. So in order to do that, we first need to harvest information. We need to extract knowledge. So from where can we get this knowledge? So all the e-commerce retailers maintain their own product catalogs. Uh, there are two typical problems with these product catalogs. One is they contain a lot of missing information. So a lot of the products may have missing brands and flavors and size information in the catalog. They could also have a lot of mistakes coming from the human data entry errors. Nevertheless, it contains a lot of structured information as well as unstructured information coming from the product profile, description titles, bullets, etc. So we want to extract information from these product profiles. So the first system that we build is called OpenTag, which we presented in KDD last year. So the input to the system are product profile information, like title, description, bullets, and some attributes of interest. And the output are structured triples of the form, say, some product has some attribute or relation, and then a set of triples. Uh, this could be multi-valued attributes as well as multi-word attributes. In order to develop this, uh, system, we use something called a sequence tagging task. Uh, so here the objective is as follows. We are given a sequence of tokens uh, of the following format. And we want to uh, attach a label or predict a tag for each of these tokens. So we are allowed to choose from one of these four classes called BIOE, which signifies the beginning, intermediate, out, or inside of the attribute value span. If we can do this successfully, then we can extract everything between B and E. That is our target attribute value of interest that we want to extract. So in order to do this, we developed a deep neural network architecture as follows. And it has four typical layers. So the first layer, the word embedding layer, it maps similar values to similar points in the concept embedding space. The BioLSTM layer would capture contextual semantics. Not all the words in a given text are important. Some are more important than the other. In order to capture that, we develop a self-attention mechanism to focus on selective concepts of interest. And finally, the uh, CRF or condition random field layer would perform the final tagging decision, maintaining the semantic consistency. Another typical problem with the product profile information is that they are noisy. There could be a lot of spelling mistakes and grammatical errors, etc. So in order to alleviate that, we also developed a convolutional neural network based on character representations of the word tokens. And we found that this gave us much higher recall than the previous system by capturing several lexical variations of the given text. So we perform uh, experiments like in several domains and attributes, et cetera, in which we find that the uh, bilestream CRF attention model performs the best. 
And using convolutional neural networks, you can get a higher recall and in, uh, improve the coverage of the system quite a lot. Another typical uh, advantage of using OpenTag is that it can discover new attribute values that you have never seen before. For example, upcoming brands, new ingredients, new flavors. Because of the sequence tagging policy, it does not depend on any predefined lexicon or vocabulary for learning and can completely discover a new vocabulary on its own. So this system is already in production. This is just a sample uh, snapshot. I'm not allowed to disclose what are the attributes, but we were able to increase the coverage of our existing system by more than 50 percentage points across different uh, attributes and domains. This is also live on several Amazon services. So if you are asking Alexa for your favorite uh, coffee products and your favorite flavored drinks, a lot of these answers are actually coming from OpenTag. Some typical problem with these uh, deep learning applications is that they are data hungry, but getting manually annotated data is expensive and time consuming. So we developed this system with something called active learning, where the system starts with a very small set of annotated samples, say 50, and then interactively and iteratively asks a human to label some informative samples from which it can learn better. With this, we were able to obtain more than 90% precision recall as well as reduce the human annotation effort by 3.3x. A lot of complaints about the neural networks is that they are kind of dark magic and you cannot really interpret what is going on inside. But using the attention mechanism, we can give certain kind of interpretations. We can say, for example, that the model is extracting beef and liver as flavor values when it is uh, focusing more on conjunctions like with and without having us to pre-program these kind of rules or logics inside the model. Again, using the word embeddings, uh, we can plot these words in a, a 2D plane, and we see that words of similar semantics come closer to each other in the embedding space. I'm sure you would have seen such figures in like several representation learning talks before. So you have the measurement units on the top right, and flavors and conjunctions together, and so on. So now we have generated extractions. The model is not perfect. It performs a lot of errors. So when we investigate the errors, we typically find two sources. The first obviously comes from noisy training levels. So, where, so once we found that OpenTag is generating a lot of flavor, a lot of colors and events as flavors. And we found that this was due to wrong data entry by the humans or the vendors. So we developed a system which uh, requires you to input a few, few keywords and it would, it would remove all semantically similar labels from the uh, training set, and the model would never predict such things as flavors, for instance. And with just simple data cleaning or cleaning up the training labels, we were able to improve its performance by 3x. The second kind of cleaning comes from the post-processing module. So the system generates a lot of extractions. A lot of them could be spurious triples. But we also learn representations for each of these values. Then we can do a simple uh, clustering. For example, we can say that if the representation or embedding of Hershey's is far apart from the embedding of other flavors like roasted almond, vanilla, or French roast, then it must be an outlier. And using this simple mechanism, we could remove a lot of noise from the extractions. So now we have generated a lot of OpenAI extractions. We have cleaned a fair amount of them. Now we would like to integrate the remaining knowledge into our product graph. So, we, so there are several OpenAI or open information extraction, uh, OpenAI extractors. We saw OpenTag before. There could be other extractors coming, coming from semi-structured data. And all of these generate string triples, like subject string, predicate string, which could be two to three words, and also like an object string. So our objective is to take these string triples and integrate them into the knowledge graph. So there we need to do certain re reasoning. Uh, at the string triple phase, there are no entities. So we need to map the subject and object to the entities. We need to know which are the textual predicates mapped to actual relations in the knowledge graph. So we have the OpenAI extractions on one hand. We have the knowledge graph on the other hand. And we need to do joint reasoning over them by which we can leverage the common entities that, can, uh, that are participating in both of them for doing the reasoning. So more, many of the prior works in doing this knowledge graph embedding or knowledge, uh, knowledge base completion learn uh, parameters specific to a given entity. 
So problem of modeling entity specific parameters is that you cannot discover new entities that you have not seen during the training phase. That is why in this work we do not model entity specific parameters, instead we only learn relations. So we will only learn relation specific embeddings and we would represent each entity as an aggregation of all the relation embeddings that it participates in, in both OpenAI and KB. This allows us to discover new entities, relations, and types. Obviously, not all the relations are important in the neighborhood of, enti uh, neighborhood of an entity. Some relations are more important than the others. For example, Steven Spielberg as a director should have much more prominence than Steven Spielberg as an actor. So we need to attend to specific relations in the neighborhood of an entity. So we developed this mechanism of dual attention mechanism uh, to perform this task. And this is a work which we are going to present in a little later this year. So we perform experiments in several knowledge bases like Freebase, IMDB, and several OpenAI extractors like Reverb and Ceres. So one observation is uh, obviously like our model with neighborhood relation encoding with attention performs the best. But the best performance is obtained on these OpenAI extractions from semi-structured data rather than on unstructured text. So the extractions from semi-structured data like web tables, lists, et cetera, are more precise and cleaner than the natural language extractions from free text, which tend to be quite ambiguous and noisy in nature. Also, the performance of the system improves as we use more domain-specific knowledge bases. For example, if you are doing inference over movie data and we, and we use IMDB as a knowledge base, then the performance is much better than using Freebase in general. Again, we learn, we learn relation specific embeddings or parameters. We could plot them in 2D, and we can see similar textual predicates. I mean, you cannot quite make out in the slide here, but similar uh, concepts in the relation space come closer to each other. On the top right, you would see a lot of overlap between film director, actor, and writer, because a lot of par entities participate in all of these relations together. So what next? So far, we have been modeling a vertical at a time, say groceries or movies or music, and we mostly harvest information from a few sources, where the Amazon catalog is the most, most authoritative source of our knowledge, but we also incorporate other knowledge bases like Freebase, IMDB, and so on. But going forward, we would like to incorporate thousands to millions of sources, like all the websites, and we could do OpenAI extractions from semi-structured data as well as textual extractions from there. The problem is a bit challenging when we want to consider the hierarchy of the different product types, and we want to model uh, semantic and ontological constraints between the different types. Going ahead, we would also like to support more intelligent applications, like search, mining, and analysis over the structured data format. But a lot of these limitations of these applications, again, come from the lack of annotated training data. So a lot of the resources <coughs> in the coming time should be invested in developing new techniques and new innovations for learning with limited labels, whereby we can explore several paradigms like active learning, transfer learning, and few short learning for adapting the system from one domain to another and make less use of human annotated data or training labels. So to summarize, uh, in this talk we saw the value of being open, how to develop a model such that it can uh, generalized to new domains, new entities, new relations and types without us having to always rely on a predefined lexicon or a vocabulary. We found that the neural networks outperform the traditional methods, not only with more data, but we need to clean the training levels a bit. And with simple cleaning, we could boost the performance by as much as 3x. A rich knowledge graph will harness power not only from structured data, but also from semi-structured representations from the websites like the DOM trees and tables and lists, and also from unstructured text. And finally, the key challenge to scale is to learn with limited labels, where we may have a human in the loop with whom we will selectively engage to provide annotation resources, but the model should be self-sufficient to generalize from one domain to another and across like thousands of sources and verticals. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have, we have time. some time for questions. There are many questions, and uh, I have the mic, so I'll start. Uh, <laughs> um, could you tell 
a few more words about the, the double at attention mechanism uh, you implemented? Um. Yeah, so, uh, so we represent each entity as an aggregation of all the relation it participates in the OpenAI and KG. Like Steven Spielberg could appear with a director relationship, writer relationship, and actor relationship. Since we are learning representations for each entity, for example, we could simply take the aggregate or average of these relation representations to represent the entity. But then we would attach equal importance to each of these relations. So the attention mechanism should itself figure out how much to weigh each of these different relations. For example, if it so happens that Steven Spielberg mostly participates in the director role and for prominent movies, then we, it would have a higher weight than the acting relation. That is a first. And again, we could selectively weigh its neighbors as well. Oh, thank you. I think this is a very impressive presentation. So a question from me is that you mentioned that to do more data cleaning using the k-means. Um, so so for, for doing that, you try to get rid of like those similar kind of right, uh, categories. So can you elaborate a little bit more about how you uh, do, like do you have to uh, rate those similar words, have a quantitative way to measure that? So for, okay, so I'll give the motivation uh, regarding this. So when we inspected the output of the system, we saw a lot of colors and flavor, a lot of colors and events as say flavors, which we do not want. So here is where the human in the loop comes, right? So the human would specify a few keywords like pink, Christmas, and coffee. Now we could use any, uh, say, some external word embedding uh, resources like word to vec and glove, and we can do clustering over those resources and remove any cluster that have these keywords. So if you give remove the cluster corresponding to pink, that means you remove all the colors as well which appear in that cluster, and the model would never learn from such training labels and would therefore mostly not predict this. Thank you. I have a question about your future work. So you mentioned that you want to move from one uh, product graph to uh, maybe a federation of different knowledge graph for different domains. Or I mean, maybe to elaborate on that, I wonder if you are thinking about a large graph federating all the others, or you're thinking about isolated different graphs for different domain, and what's the relation between the big I mean, the open domain and the domain-specific graphs. Right. Uh, so initially, when we started this project, we started with movie graphs, music graphs, and so on. And we were going deep into the relation hierarchy and associations and everything. And we found that it is quite difficult to scale. So what we developed, came up with is an idea of a broad graph, that we will only model shallow relationships of products and attributes that are very easy to do. And then we will go on a pay-as-you-go fashion. As we have more customers who are interested in a more fine-grained or rich graph, only then we will drill inside and make it and enrich it. Otherwise, we will just go with a shallow by shallow graph to increase, like, have as much width as possible. This is going to be the last question. So you mentioned that you're uh, doing the triplet extraction using OpenIE and also using that uh, sequence model to do the right. similar triplet extraction. Right. So uh, my question is, uh, open IE, the way it gives the triplets, it depends on probabilistically what kind of relation came between two uh, entities in general. Right. So uh, relation A, B, C came over the time. A came like most of the time, so it will give you A re relation between them. So if we are, uh, when we are mapping that open IE extraction with the sequence model extraction, sequence model will give the extraction for this instance of the news story or product comment. So won't that uh, mess up the relation between these two? Uh, I mean, you will have conflicts, obviously, but that is where the reasoning part comes. So you already have a lot of information in the knowledge graph with which you can, like, probably you have more prominence or more confidence over the information coming from the KG than over what is coming from the OpenAI extractions. So use the KG for grounding, and then you enrich it with more information that is coming from there. So here, one of the assumptions is that the KG is, like, mostly good. It is not very noisy. The relationship mapping using KG embeddings or word embeddings? Yeah, KG knowledge embeddings. graph embeddings. Okay, great. Thank you. And data. <laughs>